All right. Uh, excited to have this discussion with y'all, um, talking about enterprise adoption. Um, first, uh, if you could kind of briefly introduce yourself and your company and, and kind of explain where your, your company sits in the kind of value chain of facilitating enterprise adoption uh, of, of blockchain tech. My name is Hoklai. I'm the president of the Singapore FinTech Association. Uh, we are a very young association set up to support the growth of the FinTech sector. Uh, we are quite global with uh, more than uh, uh, 34 collaborations in the about 35 countries. Uh, and then uh, we have about 320 corporate members. About 80% of our members are FinTech and blockchain companies. The remaining 20% are banks, insurance companies. So our interest uh, in blockchain is really about the uh, application of uh, blockchain in financial services. Thanks. Uh, I'm Adnan Hassan. Um, by way of background, I come from the dark side. Um, I used to be, in the beginning, in the morning, they said there are two big meetings on finance that are taking place. One's uh, with the Blockchain X conference, the other one is the World Bank IMF uh, conference, and that's the past and this is the future. So I actually sat on the board of directors of the World Bank, and uh, I am a pioneer from Silicon Valley that's involved in uh, blockchain for small states. And I'll get into that when we talk more. My name is Jake. Um, I'm the founder of Rate 3 Network. So where do we stand here is uh, we're directly at the forefront because uh, we are the team that builds. Uh, focusing on two things. One is called tokenization. Uh, meaning bring asset back tokens to enterprise and second is to work on the KYC aspect So we intermit the identity protocol just a little bit more background is uh, we used to uh, No, we used to we are a series a back company before this uh, focusing on cross-border payments realizing the pain with the financial systems uh, and then we decided to build our own and uh, Now we are moving towards uh, helping enterprise like uh, equity-backed companies to adopt blockchain into their whatever product that uh, they are doing. Thanks. Um, and so kind of where, where we sit now is we are seeing more adoption. Currently, uh, we're seeing more enterprises kind of roll out proof of concepts and, and things in production. Um, Jake, I'll start with you. Come, back, come right back to you. Sure. Uh, kind of adjacent tools and technology around blockchain that uh, kind of makes it easier and, and increases adoption uh, you know, more, more quickly for sure. companies? So I think the first um, thing is I'm, I'm in the World Economic Forum, the Young Global Leader. So some of my alumni actually run uh, Fortune 500 companies. So one of it is uh, in particular uh, GS Global in Korea. So I had a meeting with him and then uh, he casually asked me this question. He said, um, I have 12 existing business lines. Each of them combined is worth and more than the entire crypto market. So why should I, what's, what's the interest for me, right? And then that brings me to think, um, you know, the market today is really young, nascent, early, and the intrinsic advantages and value of blockchain, uh, how do we actually bring it to enterprise? So for this enterprise, uh, let's call it the early adopters. If they actually bring blockchain immediately, which is a distributed database, their risk and compliance team, right, will kill them. That's like, the, we need to know that. So in today, right, the tools that are adjacent or like, you know, surrounding blockchain to bring to enterprise are uh, permission-based blockchains like Hyperledger, uh, like Consensus, uh, Kaleido. These are a few examples of how uh, you need permission to adopt blockchain into the, the existing enterprise. And then second thing, uh, which I think is um, on the adjacent front or surrounding it is uh, government initiatives. Yeah, so government initiatives, I think one, because I come from Singapore, as a Singaporean, I would say uh, Project Ubin, maybe, you know, Hotline can share more later, is a very interesting uh, blockchain initiative that's actually being led by the authorities on that front. Yeah, so directly adopting, it's uh, going to create a lot of problems for enterprise, those huge companies per se, but there are a lot of different um, hybrid models that exist today. Yeah, so that's the, I think that's what uh, the tools available, like hyperledgers and... Don, if you want to take it now. Um, I just wanted to start with a story, and uh, because that connects to where we are in this cycle. Um, in 1994, uh, 
four or five people in a small company in Silicon Valley on Ma in Mountain View. They had developed a graphical way of navigating the internet. Until then, most people who wanted to go on the internet had to type code. And they came up with the Mosaic browser that allowed people to basically navigate the internet without having to know code. That was Jim Clark, Mark Andreessen, Mike Homer, and the first couple of empl employees of what was then called uh, Netscape. And in the su that summer, in October of 1994, three months after the prototype was developed, the first prototype of an electronic global investment marketplace was created. And a year later, that prototype was showed in Indonesia in 1995. And people in Indonesia who saw that in the financial sector said, this will take 50 years for this kind of tools to come to Indonesia. Today, in every corner of Indonesia and every corner of the world, people are carrying their pockets more computing power than they did to put man on the moon, and they are networked. So the reason I give this example is because we are at that very, very first stage of that next cycle. And many of the predictions that we're making are bound to be incorrect because nobody could have really anticipated Uber or um, Airbnb or this next wave of technological phenomena. That prototype that was built in 1994 of a global investment marketplace and that presentation that was made in Indonesia in 95 was made by myself. So I've seen this cycle for frankly a generation and a half and I leave you with one sentence which is a little colorful but uh, crypto is the pornography of blockchain. Crypto is the pornography of blockchain. What does that mean? Back when the internet was getting going, quite frankly, 80% of the traffic, unfortunately or fortunately, was pornography. And then now that percentage is very small relative to all the value that's done. And in blockchain, crypto was the big thing that scared the life out of everybody. But in the same way that the internet became part of everybody's life, we're gonna see the same thing happen with blockchain, except that it's just gonna get buried under the hood. And that's where the secret lies. How do you take this complexity and bury it under the hood? The person who is using Google Maps doesn't know TCP IP, doesn't care about the complexity of connectivity or, or cloud computing. All they know is that it allows them to basically go from one place to the other. The success of what we're doing in this cycle will happen when we take complexity and bury it under the hood. And that's our task. Thanks. Certainly a quote worthy uh, statement there too. Maybe I can add on to Anam's uh, comment because like, I recall that uh, Paul Krugman, the uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, right, once commented that uh, the effect of uh, internet will not be more than that of a uh, fax machine. So I presume he's referring to that at that point in time, a lot of people are using internet for pornography. Yeah, and then uh, another very renowned uh, futurist, uh, I think uh, Amara. So he has this uh, Amara law. Basically, the law states that uh, humans' uh, expectation right, uh, is in a straight line. But uh, the development of uh, new technology is more like an S-curve. So we tend to uh, uh, overestimate the effect or the impact of a technology in the short run, but underestimate the impact in the long run. I suspect uh, blockchain, especially blockchain in enterprise, could belong to this category. The impact is going to be tremendous and it will go beyond enterprise, go into society. So that, that's what uh, some of them us talk about, the token economy. Yeah, because it will be more than just uh, uh, financial assets. It can be anything. Anything that can be tokenized, can be measured, can be given a value and can be easily transferred to one another. Thanks. Sorry. We'll stick with you here again. Uh, kind of talking about the next next phase here. In the next year, just in the next year, where do you see uh, kind of the, the most waves being made uh, for uh, you know adoption of blockchain? Kind of where you sit, you work with a lot of companies in Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of talk about where you see the next year taking us. I, I think uh, 
one of the key uh, development will be uh, the coming of age of the payments, uh, especially B2B cross-border payments. Uh, at, th at this point, I think uh, a lot of the challenges uh, lies in like uh, making it uh, very scalable, very performant. Yeah, I, I believe uh, next year that, that technical challenge will be resolved and I think uh, payment will be the one of the more interesting uh, wave. Then the, the other wave, I think, will be food, safe, food safety, something that I think uh, blockchain uh, is very suitable to use on. And then we see many, uh, many big uh, supermarkets like uh, Walmart, uh, even Carrefour, uh, announcing some initiative in, in implementing uh, food safety uh, using blockchain technology. Uh, and of course, the other one I, I, I will be uh, in the space of uh, trade finance because this is a use case whereby multiple stakeholders are involved. Currently, very much paper-based. And again, it's a use case that uh, are likely to go beyond uh, proof of concept and move into production use. Except, yeah. um, so I'm agreeing entirely with both of your earlier comments. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, I'll give you two, three data points and then tell you what I think about what next year is going to bring. Um, one, um, there are 200 countries or territories in the world, and 142 of them are under what the United Nations calls the Forum of Small States. These are countries with populations of 10 million or less. So notice that 142 of the 200 countries in the world are small states. And of the 20 per capita income richest countries in the world, per capita income richest countries in the world, 17 of them are small states. So Liechtenstein, Monaco, Singapore, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Bermuda, Bahama, Latvia, Estonia, et cetera, et cetera. So what you're gonna see next year is that when great disruption happens in any system, especially in the world, and we're at the frontier of this 2.0, it is a great advantage to be small and nimble because you can leapfrog. And we're already seeing that, which is the smaller states are where crypto, blockchain, distributed ledger, all of that's moving fast. Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Malta, Gibraltar, Switzerland, Estonia, Lithuania, Bahamas, Bermuda. What's gonna happen is that they are small they're fast, they're wealthy, and they're a lot. But they are individual, and therefore they are not at scale. So the things that's gonna happen is scaling. Scaling's the word that you wanna keep in mind, and the way the scale happens is because they get networked. They all get connected to a global integrated platform. And that's the what's gonna happen, it's sort of inevitable because they have so much in common. And a little bit of marketing, which is that there's gonna be a platform that's gonna create an ecosystem for small states to operate together on the blockchain. And that's what gonna be called the Global Bank for Small States. And that's what we have launched. So as a founder, right, because uh I, we are doing pro, we are doing work for enterprise. I won't comment on the big pictures or like initiatives that's happening. So uh, immediately, one thing that uh, we are trying to talk we are we are already working with organization is some um, IP and copyrights. Yeah. So there's uh, you know agencies in uh, over the world that holds valuable IPs and copyrights that's uh, deemed worth a lot of uh, money, but it's very illiquid. Yeah. So. We bring tokenization into these kind of uh, assets and then uh, introduce liquidity and also fractional ownership for uh, copyrights and IP. I don't call them physical assets, I, it's, it's digital, but it's very illiquid. Yeah, so that's immediately one thing that uh, is gonna already working on. But on the bigger front, I think uh, what Holland mentioned is, uh, makes sense because on the supply chain where there's a lot of intermediaries, uh, this is where most momentum is getting, being gained on the enterprise side to reduce uh, the need for these intermediaries to go through confirmations by using blockchain to increase the uh, transparency and it's very uh, cost-effective 
for enterprise that has a very deep supply chain on the side. Yeah, so I think that's the two things that I can directly comment on. Yeah, some kind of specific use cases uh, pointed out by y'all. And uh, follow up on your uh, kind of comments on the new uh, kind of banking infrastructure that you're talking about. Uh, what kind of use cases does that bring about that uh, kind of make the world uh, you know, interact more efficiently. What, yeah, what kind of explain that? Um, so the last, and I'm sorry I speak in big picture terms because I come from a big picture kind of a world, but the last uh, 40, 50 years, technology enabled globalization happened. And we call it globalization 1.0. Hasn't turned out the way we wanted, meaning that the world is not in a happy place. And the reason why is because access to capital, financial capital, intellectual capital, social capital was not broad and deep. So 2.0, globalization 2.0 has to be inclusive, has to have more participants in it, and that only happens if you create more broad and deepened access to capital. Financial capital, intellectual capital, and social capital, and that's what this technology affords us an opportunity to do. If you take blockchain, if you take AI, if you take some of these other tools, and now that we have put a supercomputer in everybody's pocket, and we have networked it, we have done that first phase, meaning that everybody's connected. So the connections are there, the infrastructure is there, is the value added stuff that was not provided. And that's where the wave of change is gonna come, because we're gonna give access Personalized, customized access to financial, intellectual, and social capital. That's going to bring millions of people into the benefits of globalization. And that's the secret of what lies in front of us. Uh, <coughs> regulation and kind of where, you know, regulation arbitrage may be opportunities for different parts of the world. Uh, we have Europe, we have Singapore. Um, where do you kind of see Singapore uh, doing well? Where can it do better in terms of kind of facilitating adoption of blockchain, uh, you know, with positive reg regulation? I guess at this point, uh, uh, in terms of uh, blockchain uh, regulation, uh, Singapore is still quite open. Uh, and one of the key reasons is really that uh, not many Singaporeans are involved in crypto. Like it or not, I think 99% of uh, Singapore residents don't even know how to I mean, get, send or receive crypto. So the risk to, to the Singapore residents are very small. But I think uh, the government uh, recognized that uh, blockchain op uh, offers a huge opportunity, especially in the space of uh, capital markets. And which is why I have been uh, pushing for like, uh, Singapore to become the next uh, financial blockchain center. Uh, in the last few years, we have become one of the leading fintech hubs. But uh, if you look at uh, securities uh, market, right, uh, the whole market size is about seventy trillion dollars. If like just ten percent of it is uh, tokenized, right, we are talking about six to seven trillion worth of uh, market. And then the, if you look at the dig the whole digital economy, that one that is being uh, driven by internet, right, is only about three to four trillion. So I expect that this uh, blockchain or token uh, economy is going to be uh, much larger, much more inclusive. And then the regulation will have to support the innovation that has come to it. So I expect that uh, some of the industry bodies will come together and start self-regulating because like um, blockchain is really still in the state of uh, being of uh, rapid involvement, and uh, it will be too early to regulate. It will be better for the industry to self-regulate first, and let uh, let the regulators uh, observe and learn together with the industry. And then, of course, uh, at some point, when it, it does pose a material risk, right, a pro more proportionate uh, measures can come in to regulate the industry. <laughs> That's my point. Regulators always run behind industry. So that's a given. And I think what you're saying is precisely right, meaning that it's the more thoughtful the industry is, the more comfortable regulators are. 
So it's damaging to the movement if we have bad actors. So I think it is incumbent on the industry to isolate bad actors and to have a center of gravity that is uh, transparent and value driven so that the regulators who are always following industry are comfortable that the industry knows what it's doing. When bad actors dominate the space, that's when regulators freak out. And when regulators freak out, they just come in with a two by four and just shut the whole place down. And yeah, you can run around and do the regulatory arbitrage looking for places to go, but that game doesn't go on for long because then you have global regulation and the global two by four comes. So the answer is very clear, which is the industry's got to self-regulate and do it in a way that's you know, sober and mature. And uh, that will allow for the growth of the process to be you know, more efficient and more uh, effective. Uh, uh, Jake, uh, Hawk mentioned specifically some numbers around tokenization of assets in Singapore. Uh, something that you all work with enterprises on is kind of tokenization use cases. Uh, can you talk a little bit about one, uh, something that's kind of become a rule for something, some new technology to be adopted, it's kind of the 10x. Like is it 10x faster, 10x cheaper, 10x better in a specific way? Can you talk about uh, kind of the value proposition that y'all bring to the table, right. tokenization for enterprises? Um, it's a little bit of uh, turning, it's actually, no, the idea is liquidity here, right? So when I talk to enterprise, uh, they, they are not really that concerned with all these things. Their picture is uh, how do I, you know, basically be able to gain from this. That's, that's the business standpoint. And then uh, you go out to them, you tell them two things. One is enterprise has uh, one problem when it comes to depreciation of assets. So they are, they are huge. They have assets that are just sitting there idling. So they, they are thinking, how do I uh, reduce the cost on this? Second front is uh, just on the example of IP, right? Because uh, yesterday we, I just met the the company that uh, basically owns the uh, entire Jackie Chan's movies, IP, everything, the copyright. So uh, in valuation point, standpoint, that's worth uh, 100 million, of, that's more than uh, net worth, uh, net north of 100 million dollars. But the question to them was, uh, how do I turn this 100 million dollars into something that's, uh, can I get from it, right? Because the IPs are sitting there. Yeah, they, they, they can't trade, they can't do anything about it. So we look into it and then we tell them like, hey, if you have a big enough ecosystem, a uh, consensus concept within their own circle, the movie industry, whatever it is, and they accept like the, the tokenization form of these IPs, which enables them to, to, to film in other countries and things like that. So I'm talking about really real life things, right? How do you actually bring the idea of tokenization into enterprise today? And it was not easy to, com to tell them this because uh, coming from a technical background, I can tell you, hey, uh, this can go up to 16 decimal point. It's amazing. This, um, I can add a lot of functionality on top of the tokens that represents the assets that you tokenize. That's cool. But to the business, uh, they are not really that concerned about how cool the technology is, but more like how do they actually utilize it. Yeah, so it got me to a point where I think that uh, this is a bit like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not uh, as senior as uh, them, but it's a bit like internet, right? But when, when the browser was uh, created, and then you'd be like, hey, what should I do with it? Create a website. You know, and then like Stripe, a $20 billion company, do a plug-in for a website to buy things. We are very early in many things. But tokenization or in, the, in this area for enterprise is, is, uh, is um, your imagination is your limitation. Yeah. Because there are so many ways where I sit down, I think of how this technology can help you change how you work with your partners, your, your ecosystem, and I feel pretty amazed, like, you know, how... Uh, how much uh, wonders can you do? And I don't think one session is enough for me to <laughs> share what can I, what else can I do? The, uh, talking about the browser experience, uh, in 94, 95, um, because the browser was developed both at NCSA, uh, in, sorry, at, in, at, uh, by Mosaic in California and NCSA in the US, and then by Tim Berners-Lee's in CERN. So there were two different locations from where the browser sort of emerged. So we went to the, we wanted to take the browser global, 94, and we went to the US uh, uh, Commerce Department because export runs under the US Commerce Department. And can you imagine, in, we're not talking about 100 years ago, we're talking 95, all right, it's a generation ago, some people here weren't born, but nevertheless, 
the browser, because it had SSL encryption technology inside it, came under missile export regulation. So to export, imagine this, to export a single browser, you had to get exemption from the US missile export regulation. That's what we're talking about for a single browser. Today, I mean, does anybody even talk about that? It's ubiquitous. And that's where we're going to see where the regulatory reality. So the, um, you know, a, con a country, a central bank, finds it so much, you know, with all love and respect to my central bank friends, and they are friends of mine, basically, they say, listen, you know what? I got one term left. I just don't want to deal with this headache under my thing. Just ban it, delay it until I leave. And that's essentially the unfortunate thing, which is that because it is so disruptive, it's much easier to bas basically say, look, you know what? Just shut it down. Just don't, no crypto allowed, no this allowed, no export of that allowed. Literally, I'm saying that we've seen this whole game once before. Browser technology needs missile export exemption. And that's where we are with respect to the cycle. And today, of course, you know, nobody even thinks about that. And that's what's going to happen in a shorter period of time in this cycle, where these, this stuff is going to get embedded underneath the hood. And every single regulator globally is going to have to come to terms with the fact that this is now embedded in the entire ecosystem. I go back to small states because the if you can get this, the prime minister, central bank governor, minister of finance, and five or four business leaders in a room, you get the whole system moving. And that's why the small states are moving faster than the bigger ones. And if you can network them, then basically you move the entire ecosystem forward in one fell swoop. And that's going to happen. It's going to happen much faster than it did in that last cycle. So kind of touched on uh, some of the bureaucratic uh, kind of hold up in some bigger institutions. I think it's fitting that we're talking about sovereigns and, and central banks in the setting this, this uh, week in Bali. Um, one thing that the World Bank is concerned about, uh, you know, around the world is um, poverty and, and jobs. Uh, you know, one, one thing that, uh, you know, kind of a fear that people bring up with any new technology is it's going to kill jobs, it's going to take people, um, you know, out of the equation here. Uh, non, back to you uh, on this. What's, what's kind of the future of the organizational structure for enterprises that kind of decentralization brings to the table? Is there a risk there for jobs? Is there, uh, you know, what's, what's your take on that? You want me to? Yeah, yeah um, look, um, we've been through these cycles. Uh, it used to take so many farmers to cut a field. And um, I had a chance to go to uh, a, a soybean farm in Brazil a few years ago, a number of years ago, and uh, we were about 5,000 meters high on a plane, and the owner told me that the, Mr. Hassan, you see where the sun is setting? That's where half the field is. So that's how massive the soybean farm was. We looked down, there were 12 combines working, cutting the soybean farm, soybean, and not one of them had a person on it. They were all GPS run and 24 hours. All right, so now you've gone where the farmers used to, you know, thousands of people were probably employed, and you have zero employed. On the other hand, today, 10 of the most valuable, of the 20 most valuable companies in the world, 17 of them are technology companies. What's going to happen with work is, yeah, there's going to be incredible disruption, but people, every single person is going to become a multinational corporation. Every single person will be a brand, and they will trade globally. Their value will be conducted peer-to-peer -peer on a global basis. And that's where the great innovation is going to come. Because individuals will both be recipients and suppliers of capital. They'll receive intellectual capital. They'll receive social capital. They'll receive financial capital. They will provide financial capital, social capital, and intellectual capital on a global basis. And these tools and these devices that are sitting in your pocket, networked around the world, are the highways through which that three forms of capital will get transacted. So the future of work 
is fantastic for those who can absorb this new world. There's obviously those who can't is where the problem lies. And we've got to come up with some way of incentivizing and managing their process. And there are things that people talk about, you know, global income and minimum incomes and all that that'll answer that problem, that challenge. But the bottom line is every person becomes an importer and exporter of global capital. I think I agree with him. Like, uh, I mean, if you look at the past 100 years, right, uh, there are several uh, technological revolutions. I mean, steam engine, you have internet, and I think uh, we managed to to uh, to uh, recover from that. Uh, many jobs today are not ambition like 10 to 20 years ago. So new, uh, although some some jobs might become uh, less relevant, but new roles will be created. So I I presume, I, I my personal opinion is. Uh, I believe uh, it will happen the same to, to blockchain. New roles will, 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 will be created, and then I think we'll do just fine. And then one, one particular thing is that uh, with this uh, blockchain technology, right, uh, it actually expands the entire market, right? Because if you just look at uh, financial inclusion, we have 2 billion people unbanked. The, the blockchain has the power to, to bring them into the, the former economy, and then that will actually expand the entire market and then new roles will be created to, to, to service them. Yeah. Bit payments, micropayments, bit pesa were not invented in Silicon Valley, it was in Kenya. Uh, the first fully digitized fiber optic global uh, information network was not in Sweden, was not in Singapore, was not in the Canada, it was in Djibouti. Why? Because they had no copper, nothing on the ground, and they just leapt over the whole thing. So there's some opportunities that latecomers have because they leap over. And if you're small and nimble and fast, you leap over quickly. How you leverage is, at the end of the day, you've got to human capital investing in people. And now that's the other awesomeness that you can actually give the entire MIT uh, educational facilities to a kid in Burundi at essentially n relatively no cost. So in my view, we have this period of uh, you know, the two billion unbanked, but we have this incredible opportunity to get the entire world participating in the benefits of technology-enabled globalization. And so I come out of this thing optimistic. Um, the things that we have done over the last 30, 40 years, you know, we took the mainframe computer, shrunk it, shrunk it down to the PC, laptop, all the way down to the phone, and we put it in people's pockets. Then we took technology and we basically, you know, used to make a phone call, it was $3 the first minute, $1 the next, and we essentially brought it to zero. Then we put clouds out there and we connected everybody. And we've already done that. So now it's just a matter of adding that three forms of capital and access to it. And that's, to me, the best era is in front of us. We're gonna go through this period of uh, adjustment, but we'll create opportunities for people everywhere around the world. Um, we've gotta keep pushing at it. And uh, I think with that, um, we do create a, a world that's a little bit more uh, two, globalization 2.0 will look better than 1.0. 1, 1 1.0 1 really created inequality. My view is 2.0 is actually gonna broaden and flatten it. And every, when everybody becomes a sort of a global actor, the word, the two words I wanna leave you with, one is scaling, that things are gonna get scale, three words, scaling, consortiums, ecosystems, uh, and uh, a peer to peer. I think those three uh, are what the future will uh, afford us. We all, we all kind of work in the space and are, are bullish, I think. Uh, maybe to uh, kind of think, uh, think about the risks for a second. Uh, maybe what are, what are kind of the, you know, this conversation's had kind of an air of inevitability, uh, inevitability of adoption and, and progress here. What are kind of the, the two biggest risks you see standing in the way of progress over the next, uh, you know, few years? Uh, you know, you work with companies that are thinking about these problems and talking about them. What are, what are, what are you seeing as risks? Uh, Jake? You want me to go for it? You want me to go ahead? I'll, I'll go. 
Okay, I think the number one risk is really regulation because like, uh, yeah, as you can see, like uh, it seems like uh, uh, regulators in the emerging uh, economies are more open about the uh, use of the blockchain technology than those in the, the advanced economy. Uh, the other challenge is really mindset. Actually, especially if we are, we are talking about uh, blockchain in enterprises, right? Because like in enterprises, we expect uh, uh, new technology, I mean technology to have like uh, enterprise support. Uh, we expect it to be easily integratable to their ERP system and to their core business system. We expect uh, skilled uh, talents are available. But we know that uh, currently for blockchain, all these are not really quite in place. And that will actually inhibit uh, the adoption of uh, blockchain in enterprises. You know, the reason I'm optimistic about stuff is because um, there's an inevitability in the sense that, look, uh, information flow is glo global. Uh, uh, the climate is global. Uh, disease is global. Uh, refugees are global. Crises are global. So we are inevitably in a global integrated world. There's just no escaping it. The risk is that we delay the solutions for it. And that's where we are right now, where basically there's a, a uh, on the geopolitical front, that's where the big risk is. That basically on the geopolitical front, people are talking about nationalism, about uh, authoritarianism, about tariff barriers, about uh, borders, uh, in a world that is guaranteed to be interconnected. It just, you, you don't show up to the border of a country and say to climate change, please, don't you know you, you can't cross over? All that pollution is gonna be on that side. You don't say to disease, stay on this side. You don't say to economic crises, you don't say to information. So the big risk is, in my mind, is that we are in a global world and we have nationalistic mind mentalities. And the longer we are unable to come up with solutions that address global realities, the more delay there is between what we need and what we have today. And to some extent, right now, there's the world split in two groups. One group that basically says, look, shut the borders, close it up, put on tariffs, stop exports, and good luck. As long as it's good for me, that's all I care about. It's not sustainable. So the answer has to come from something that's more uh, uh, globally uh, owned, and that's where globalization 2.0 argument comes in, that we need to have a globalization 2.0 that's more broad and deep in the sense that more people benefiting from this technology-enabled phenomena that we created 40 years ago. Um, so the risk really is that uh, there's a delay and that delay comes and then the regulators are used as a way to kind of, you know, put the tariffs, put the barriers and all that, it just delays stuff. So with the broad feature explained, uh, the only risk that I can share probably to everybody's uh, uh, can use is with technical, on a technical standpoint, right? So I think the answer here would be more imperfect knowledge. Um, look, e Ethereum is probably the most uh, Turing complete uh, public blockchain today. When I say, when we say Turing complete, that means uh, for the functionalities that it's asked to provide, you can trust that the ERC20 token built on a protocol will do what it takes. But if you look at the index today on the ERC side, the 721, 825, you know, there's tons of uh, uh, initiatives uh, being done, right, to improve how uh, Ethereum as a blockchain should uh, advance. Even Vitalik himself uh, wasn't uh, that concerned about the TPS back then. And now Plasma is trying to solve this problem, right? So many times the network congested and things like that. So uh, the imperfect knowledge where we, and tap into the peer-to-peer -peer standpoint that you mentioned would lead to a lot of issues. People are not that informed of what it can do. And then they, get, they, they, they see certain things, they think that uh, this can do what they uh, imagine it to be without understanding that there's a technical limitation to it. So the majority of uh, blockchains today uh, might or might not be uh, you know, entirely conveyed to the user. And the user might, when it comes to money, right, finance, finance in, uh, involvement, they might just lose money. And that itself, on a global perspective, when it's peer-to-peer -peer and things like that, there's a lot of fraud being done, and it takes uh, huge uh, damage to the entire ecosystem again, and then we need to go back to the, oh no, cryptocurrency, you know, fraud, uh, fraudulent, how can I trust this thing? But at the end of the day, it's just imperfect knowledge being, pun, being done, and with the rise of how uh, transactions can be done from peer-to-peer, this is going to cause uh, you know, a huge problem. And uh, that's a risk that we really need to mitigate. And I think so, yeah. yeah. Terrific, terrific points there for sure. Um, 
Any questions from the audience? Uh, we have about one minute left. If, if anybody near the front wants to raise a hand and, and ask our panelists anything. Um, last question then uh, for, for each of you. Uh, what are, you know, work with a lot of companies. Uh, what, what are the companies or, or sovereigns that you see leading the way right now and, uh, you know, as being a good example of how to be proactive and, and, and kind of safe and how you start to adopt this tech? Uh, maybe start with you, Hawk. Use objective, right? <laughs> I have to say Singapore. <laughs> But, but that, that's a fact because, like, uh, it's, it's a published uh, uh, a fact that uh, we encourage uh, innovation. Uh, uh, the managing director of uh, the central bank and the regulator stated that uh, uh, regulation should not front run uh, innovation. But of course, we want to do it in a way that uh, still make the financial system safe. Yeah, so that's why the, we have been introducing quite a number of initiatives. And even like uh, the regulator itself uh, taking the lead uh, by experimenting with blockchain for, for interbank and cross-border uh, fund transfer. Yeah. So just to add on Singapore, as Singaporean, right? <laughs> that a sentence that was being published because so we as founders do need to talk to MES on a very regular basis. So it's a, a smart economy, it's a safe economy. Right, that's what they say. So in this standpoint, you know, no matter how innovative or the way that we want to run, make things better, is it ultimately it's come, it boils down to how uh, fundamentally secure the, the initiatives that we want to take. Secure in the sense that uh, do, you pro do you protect the innocent, right, the young from being uh, uh, fraudulent activities and things like that. Second is uh, how do you ensure that uh, as we you know, uh, run so fast and we don't break things, break too much things along the way. Yeah. So there's actually a sandbox model. Uh, sandbox is uh, MAS, their initiative such that uh, you, enter, you enter it, uh, you operate anything you want within their uh, you know, framework, and then they will tell you whether this is right or this is wrong. So it's just, this, this was, I think, one of the great initiatives like, that's being done by uh, Singapore government. So uh, given the fact I'm with oh, two Singaporeans either side, uh, I think the way to look at it is on a regional basis uh, rather than a global basis. So per region, and I look at it as five regions, and per region you've got people who are uh, certainly regional leaders. I mean, and there's no question about Singapore is, uh, is phenomenal. I know them very well, and I think they've been doing that for a while. But each region, I mean, if you look at the, the sort of the Gulf region, you've got Dubai and Qatar Abu Dhabi doing Bahrain, doing some interesting stuff. Look at Mediterranean down there with Gibraltar and Malta. You look north, Estonia, Lithuania, the Swiss. You go across and you see in the Caribbean, you see Bermuda and Bahamas. What will be, I go back to the original point, that what you will see is that invariably the smaller states are the ones that are leading it. And that there will be, a un, the, the breakthrough will happen when you get more uniformity in the regulatory and other uh, standardizations that happen across these, because then you get scale. And that's, so the two things to take away is that per region there's somebody who's sort of taking the frontier and then they're converging to a set of uniform guidelines. And the small states will have them in a standardized way much earlier. And that's where the answer lies. All right, thanks guys. And uh, thank you all. <laughs>